Today is May 20th, 2014, and this is episode 111. This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is a new field of study. Consult your local futurist, lawyer, and investment advisor before making any decisions whatsoever for yourself. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today's episode is a little different. Episode 111 of Let's Talk Bitcoin is all about Amir Taki and the movement of thought that he embodies. We start today's show with Cody Wilson, a proud anarchist in his own right who over the last year has spent more and more time with Amir. At Bitcoin Expo Toronto, Cody gave a wide-ranging talk called Light and Dark that provides his perspective. I don't know Cody personally, but his demeanor strikes me as that of an anthropologist who's discovered a hidden culture that has its own norms and rituals and simply decided that he likes that better and never gone back. Then, I sat down with Amir for an intimate chat about discovering life's meaning, about the honor and duty of having the skills to perform good work at a time when it's needed, and more. Thanks to Brave the World and Can Awareness for these recordings and the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada for putting on the event. Enjoy the show. Crypto anarchist that is the founder and director of Defense Distributed, the nonprofit digital publisher behind the infamous 3D printed gun, Bitcoin Dark Wallet. Cody was recently listed in Forbes 30 Under 30 as the face of printable firearms and was named by Wired as one of the 15 most dangerous people in the world. Judges mainstream mainstream reputation for yourself, as you'll see Cody's motives are positive. With great moral moral character and determination, his work is respected as having great positive influence in the most disruptive and controversial spaces. Thanks, Cody. Um, I'm really glad, by the way, this isn't like a thousand people, so let's have something more conversational, yeah? Okay. I have some quick notes. I threw out everything I was going to... Did, did any of you guys come to the hackathon yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Did you guys get to catch... Uh, Ooh, hackathon. Did you catch Amir Taki's um, dark market presentation? Fantastic. I think I'll start with that, and then we'll kind of roll into discursive points. But, um, the title of the speech is Light and Dark. Not that titles matter, but I think it's something that we can start with. There has been a kind of duality finally recognized by the mainstream accounts of Bitcoin. Trending toward, it's something we were trying to help you get toward uh, with our announcement of something like a dark wallet. Um, that there would be this like Manichaean um, understanding of Bitcoin. You know, there's the legitimate factors of Bitcoin, and then there's the black markets. You know, there's, there's the white market Bitcoin that we're all trying to kind of work together for. And there's the black market Bitcoin, which is an anomaly, you know, kind of outside of things. Something that was like an accident of history, should have been allowed to happen. But we're kind of moving past it. Uh, thank God. This is how um, the, the Senate hearings on the Silk Road were, were, were formulated. After the Silk Road, right? Post Silk Road, uh, kind of wishful, magical thinking. We're dispelling the ghost of whatever that was. Who knows why that happened? But now that it's over, let's talk about how we can work together, kind of unionize and synthesize this wonderful technology, which of course has great social import. How can we work together to make this thing a good thing for everyone? Um, this is a form of like light thinking. Um, their spiel is the best uh, after South by Southwest. They said, um, Ursum of Coinbase now represented, he was the great hope of Bitcoin, you know, in the United States. Uh, it's light inside. Everything else was the kind of barbarian horde threatening to pull Bitcoin back into the dark. Uh, and of course, this is a very thematic we wanted to establish with our presentation of the dark wallet, which I should go ahead and say. Um, it's something like CryptoKit, which is just kind of doing Bitcoin in the browser, but with an express intentionality. I mean, it, it means to be anarchist. And what do we mean by anarchist? Well, pseudonymity, anonymity for the user, uh, default, right, care for the user, that's why. And basically, obfuscatory techniques to prevent law enforcement from kind of trying to who you are and what you're doing. I mean, um, basically, the idea is like, well, if there's this potential of Bitcoin to become the kind of anonymous digital cash of uh, of the future, to really kind of plunge everything into the dark markets, uh, then it should be kind of developed in this direction. And no one's kind of taking this challenge on because of the threats of uh, FinCEN in the United States, uh, no one can get venture capital for expressing this kind of intention. You know what's crazy is <laughs> during the 3D printed gun saga, uh, which I'm sure isn't quite over yet, but <laughs> oh, it was like March of last year, I was at this, this huge 3D printing conference in, in New York. And, you know, 
there was like a traveling prospectus, businessmen, venture capital, which just packed thousands of people. And I, I did this, this report on the 3D printed gun, and, and no one actually knew it was kind of possible at that point. But I had this giant room all to myself. It was just like 16 people on me, and I was like, well, it's going to be a 3D printed gun in two weeks. And I was like, hmm, yeah, very interesting. But just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it shifts in the night, man. No one even knew I was there, you know, just kind of in and out. I want to be a little serious though, so light and dark, what do I mean? I mean? We're trying to set up these thematics between legitimacy, got the token word of all things Bitcoin, especially since the summer. How do we make Bitcoin legitimate? What is legitimacy? What is sovereignty? How do we uh, encourage adoption? How do we, how do we break ourselves and remove ourselves from this history of illicit and illegitimate activity? Um, this kind of separation, or if you will, white markets and black markets, or if you will, as I like to do, we can, we can establish these ideas in people. Um, so the first person I'll hold up to you is Charlie Shrem. Charlie Shrem is basically the founder or co-founder of the Bitcoin Foundation. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He believed in advocacy for a legitimacy for Bitcoin. He believed in what I call, um, what we theorize as a state science, a state philosophy, a philosophy of stability, of models, of rigidity, of fixity, of templates. He thought if we could encourage the state to give us a processional model, right, we could all recognize a kind of platonic form of Bitcoin, which we could move toward that. We'd all have a kind of consensus about what Bitcoin was, and we could all kind of enter the light and the kingdom, and vast kind of go there together. Uh, and Charles Truman wanted to enter that kingdom. You know, he felt very much that he could, that they would kind of welcome him into. And what did he do? Beyond contributing to a rhetoric about the legitimacy of Bitcoin, Charlie Shrem conceives of this concept of the bit license. God, it's not like a pernicious name. The bit license, right? Oh, I'm so used to kind of naming bit everything. I mean, the regulators themselves, like, granted, this is from Charlie Shrem, but they even kind of fold in their own pernicious regulatory activity into the, like this sweet lozenge of, uh, of Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> nomenclature or whatever. Oh, the bit license. Oh, well, yeah, the bit license, sure. <laughs> I mean, no, it's, it's evil, you know, it's, it's deeply, deeply troubling, so, uh, and you're already conditioned to kind of accept it. Well, I've got my, you know, I've got my bit exchange and my bit license, and, you know, like, it's just, <laughs> it's operating on you without even knowing. Um, he goes to Bin Lossi of New York DFS, and for two years, he suggests, and they, they tell him, and this is, oh, by the way, I visited him in, in Brooklyn, I mean, this is not, I'm not making this up about this is the conversation that we had. Uh, he says, um, they go, well, Charlie, you know, we really like to regulate Bitcoin. How do we do that? Can we regulate the software? And if not, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, here's what you can do. You can regulate the businesses, right? You can make sure that you have a kind of gateway by which all businesses have to pass through. Everyone can bend the knee in New York, because you know New York's got to get its cut. New York's always going to be a part of finance. Oh, right? So uh, here's what we can do. We can set up a kind of regulatory framework that all people will, uh, will contribute to. Uh, coin setter, you guys familiar with coin setter? Coinsetter is, and you will be, or you won't be, it doesn't matter, but what Coinsetter did is the first kind of a, a bank, so betrayal. Um, this is like something you can learn in Kafka. They didn't, Ben Lasky didn't tell us what the bit license would be. He asked for Bitcoin businesses to propose directly to him what they thought a bit license should be. So Coinsetter made the first application. They wrote it down, they suggested the policy framework by which they would like to be regulated, but not just the framework, they suggested what even the content of the four corners of a document of a bit license would be, and submitted that to the EFS. My criticism in the Dark Wall video is simply not that, oh, the foundation's evil. It's that you're doing it to yourselves. By participating in the state philosophy, by giving it that kind of already default position of, uh, of legitimacy, you're saying, Okay, well, one, we can maintain independence from a regulatory process, but also participate in it. But at the same time, you're doing it to yourself. In the end, the regulators didn't descend. They didn't kind of, you know, operationalize everything and then kind of tell you what to do. The community itself, uh, like when SpaceX was deciding how to go into space, they go, wait, wait a minute, we can't just fly into space. We need to ask someone if we can do this. They literally created a regulatory framework for themselves because they, they felt naked under the open sky. You know what I mean? Same thing with Bitcoin. I'd like to hold out an opposition to, to Charlie Shrem, the Miritaki. The Miritaki gave his presentation at the hackathon yesterday for the dark market. In 30 hours, he developed and distributed Silk Road. Silk Road being the, the deep web's great uh, monumental marketplace for, for the selling of, of Bitcoin and the distribution of drugs. I mean, it's, it's only vloggers that are decentralized, and eventually they were able to uncover where it was and find its, its administrator, allegedly. Uh, he's now facing trial. He'll be facing trial in November. His name is Ross Ulbricht. If you haven't thought of 
supporting Mr. Holbrook or really seeing if he's worthy of your support, I recommend you go to freeross.org. Check it out today. The thing is, we can think of this literally. Amir Taki, if you don't know him by reputation, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you. Amir Taki is a nomad. The rest of my remarks come from a, an essay by Guy Deleuze called Nomadology. Amir Taki travels. He's an itinerant. He doesn't have a fixed location, no permanent address. He can't get paychecks, right? He's not interested in having a job and being localized at one point. My, my, my thought is now that Amir Taki isn't just an artist, although this is how he presented Dark Market after this huge speech and, and showing you what he did. I'll describe Dark Market in a minute. This final statement was, software is art. He doesn't think of what he's doing as hard science. He thinks about it as improvisation, as dynamic. As, as just as pure artistic, not just technique, um, but expression. Contrast this to Charlie Tran. The state wants things centralized, if you will, in one place, localized. What's always threatening the state? What's exterior to it? The itinerant mentality. Just think of defense distributed. Oh my god, where are they? They've got 3D printers, they're printing guns. What are they doing? <laughs> they need to be in one place. So in, order to, in order to make guns an element of the war machine, in the United States, you have to have a permanent address. You have to be somewhere. Somewhere we can come get you and find you and know where you are or tell you where you should be. Um, in Charlie Shrimp's case, this is taken to the absolute, right? After they've kind of gotten everything from him about regulating Bitcoin, they put him under house arrest in his parents' house. He's stuck. He showed me his ankle bracelet. Yeah. He goes a step past his door, SWAT team. Yeah. He's localized. He's fixed. Fixity. He has to obey this kind of like stricture. And this is just isn't the idea of cages and jails and everything. It's, it's this idea of stability and fixity. Amir Taki doesn't even kind of abide by his social expectations. Where is he? He's gone. <laughs> What's he doing? He's in Austria. Uh, they, they go on a, on a Segway tour. <laughs> he doesn't understand the idea. He just goes off on his Segway, you know? He's like, where's Amir? <laughs> He'll hate those own stories. Amir, are you here? Okay, he's got, of course he's not here, right? Why would he come to a scheduled event? Like, it's not <laughs> That he would even need to be here. And do you think he'd have a name tag? No, of course not. So they're looking for a mirror, you know? And he, he, he sees some girl giving away free hugs and then jumps off the segue to give her a hug. But of course, segways don't stop, they keep going. So, so the segue keeps going, crashes into a tree, you know? The segue is now broken. A mirror is afraid of the authority that runs the segue uh, tour, you know? Like uh, this woman, she'd be very upset. So he, he hears she's coming, he runs away, and they don't see him for the rest of the day. So the segue woman now has to write her segue in the second segue. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he's not just this kind of goblin. He's not just like this 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 weird cherub of, of, of the digital black markets. I mean, he really understands something or lives a certain kind of model of thought. Or we should say something like approximate knowledge or um, nomad science is what I'm calling it. He 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 thinks of. Well, let's give you a more concrete example. Um, and this is light and dark. I'm trying to say here. There's this 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 world of hard forms and royal science and rigidity and stability and templates. And then there's something like the Gothic journeyman building cathedrals uh, centuries ago, right? They used to travel around, they were itinerant, and they had their monk masons uh, who would follow them around, and, and they didn't learn, uh, and they didn't really practice Euclidean geometry. They were just, they were all about expressing this. What did they want? We wanted to build bigger, we wanted to build dynamically. And if you, if you look at back at these Gothic journeymen, they didn't need blueprints. Or if they had them, they were nothing like the, the finished forms that you saw. They were just interested in projection. You know, expression, taking a form or taking an original place and just with like Archimedean kind of intuition, project building out, kind of creating just this dynamically, improvisationally on the spot. Brick allures they were. They took what was around them, they took a kind of sense and intuition from the things around them and built incredibly expressive buildings. The thing about this is, of course, some of these collapsed in the 12th century and after, right? Uh, or beyond in other places, especially in France, I mean, and the state always eventually comes in and in the name of something like safety or in the name of something like, you know, reproducibility, starts to regulate the construction sites of these great cathedrals. And I, I'm using cathedral on purpose here, right? Uh, open source itself has a cathedral model, and if it is, think about it. So there's, there's a heart in the game that's, that's intentional. The great expressive features of these itinerant craftsmen are slowly kind of cut away in the interest of something else, something of like a rigid stable form. And I believe the analogy is clear. This is kind of what's at stake something like Bitcoin. Why is it obvious that we have to kind of ask for a procession of models from authority figures? Yes, of course, we have to live in the world. We have to make money. Okay? But what we're sacrificing is something like the kind of intuition, something like I mean, you're talking about dark market. Now I'll talk about it more. Dark market is the fastest response to the problem of the Silk Road. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer Silk Road, if you will. It settles all the problems, distributed identity, uh, reputation. Decentralization. 
self identities, basically. This is an enemy. That's for Bitcoin, all this stuff. Except he's, they, they just showed it, and the, the proof of concept is up. I think you can go to bitcredits.io and see the, kind of the results of their work. Uh, not today, then tomorrow, maybe, but uh, they, they showed it in real time. A distributed so good. Now there's not one node uh, of failure, there's not a choke point. This was done in 30 hours. This is this thread, and this is the fundamental question mark, something like Bitcoin, an entire mode and paradigm of that. It was done in 30 hours by an artist who doesn't have a stable page yet. He did it kind of uh, by pure artistic expression and will. And he has, what's that? Dark Market Oh, thanks. Dark Market GitHub, if you'd like to see the, the repo. And you'll see all the commits. All the commits were done literally like, in the last 48 hours during that. Maybe uh, if you wanted to ask a question, maybe you can have some people start lighting up at the microphone and uh, when you are ready to answer those questions. I'm always so intelligent. Well, I think I really made most of the points then, right? So this is for mistake thinking. But let me give you one more little story with some questions. There is um, Light and Dark again, Light and Dark, right? State science, royal, uh, fixed templates, and then nomad science. So I give you this is a heartbreaking, but like I think a central kind of story. So Hurston of Coinbase is now uh, thought to be the kind of uh, real thought leader, the man who the, the mantle of the future of Bitcoin is now being kind of placed on his shoulders. And these people in San Francisco come to me and they, you know, they've declared victory. Uh, Gox is dead, the foundation is essentially dead. And so now San Francisco will take the helm and lead Bitcoin into this bright paradise. And Charlie Shrim has just learned a whole lot about um, Erson's at this panel in South by Southwest, the first person to come up to the microphone to ask him a question after his kind of very consensus, you know, blase presentation about you know, Bitcoin or, you know, whatever, corporate Bitcoin, is Ross Holbrook's mother, Lynn Holman. How did she get in there? Well, we, we smuggled her in. So she gives, she drives the microphone, right? The mother of the man who basically engendered Bitcoin, right? Who made you know this smarmy Gawker reporter who thinks he made Bitcoin happen because he reported on the Silk Road, right? Ross Ulbricht was in so many spiritual senses, like the father of Bitcoin. It's shepherd into something like the mainstream. It's proof of all the dark things that we think are, you know, still to come. But no, he did it first and he made Bitcoin. He gave it that kind of essential traction. It worked in black markets. Look at that. It worked against the kind of investigative procedures and intercepted will of the state. It worked. And we all got excited about it. Ross Ulbricht did that. More than, more than, I had more to share than anyone else. And so she asks, Russell Brooks' mom, she asks her, what would you say to my son? Don't you think that what he did was, can't we say something about what he did? Don't you think what he, work like his is important to the future of Bitcoin? And keeping in mind this idea of fixity and models and rigidity, state science has turned someone like this Urson character himself into a kind of caricature. He, by his pressure above him, this, these venture capitalists, the pressure on his business as a kind of soul, point now for exchange and his relationship with Silicon Valley Bank, and I'm sure that uh, his relationship with regulators, he couldn't say a thing. He stumbled. He had nothing to say. He knew he couldn't say anything. And who knows, but it doesn't matter if like, he's an anarchist at heart, like some of these guys I met the other day. Anarchism is not a feeling. He was rendered impotent by the state of science. The mother of one of the great nomad scientists, right? The guy who, in the, in the full abandon uh, and recourse, recourse to his own efforts, built this beautiful marketplace in total secrecy. Without rules of the road, right? His mother asks Ursum to just say one thing, and he can. It's a bang. It's a betrayal. It's a bang. And that's an impotent model, ladies and gentlemen, that will never go anywhere. So I'll, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for thinking of this duality with me. We need to come up with a certain kind of terrorist metaphysics to Bitcoin. Don't be afraid of the dark. <laughs> dark market. CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. Hi, listener. Here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're building a global network of correspondents able to contribute on-the-ground perspective when cryptocurrency-related information comes across their filters. 
If you'd like to join our global conversation, send an email with your name and geographic or cultural niche to apply at letstalkbitcoin.com. Just like Bitcoin, the only barrier to entry is your time and good work. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, thanks. The dark wallet was funded, uh, was crowdfunded. What do you think would be the best way to crowdfund dark market? Well, you know, I don't know. And again, Amir would tell you the dark market was just a pure proof of concept, so it's not production ready. It's amazing what he was able to show these gentlemen. Google this, find this if you can. I'll, I'll get a mirror to get a, a production site up, and maybe we'll do a video on DD. But um, I think that since the code is already publicly available, it's all right for people to kind of make something more stable and just throw it out there. And I don't think we necessarily need to crowdfund. Maybe we should. I feel like I can't right now. I, I just, we just crowdfunded Dark Wallet maybe six months ago. We got a, ni a nice amount of money. And even though Bitcoin's falling a bit in price, we capitalized well. And I feel like I can't ask for money yet until we really develop Dark Wallet in an alpha and then a beta that you can enjoy and see as a kind of proof of, of your generosity. Assuming you, know, you have collected the funded Dark Wallet. So I recommend that anyone try. But what's interesting is that this is almost kind of like, you know, like Athena or something kind of already fully formed and out there. It's just up to attract people to give it something like a stable, a stable release. Um, if we don't see something like that coming, I'm, I'm happy to, to back it myself with, I don't know, credit cards. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I hope we find someone willing to kind of take the helm here. I've been, if, if you guys go to unsystem.net, I recommend you get on the unsystem mailing list, which is just a kind of crypto mailing list. But, Everyone's very excited about this, right? I mean, the, the wheels are turning. Everyone's talking about this stuff. Um, it, it had been thought for a while that there would be like an open transactions version of this that was kind of soon to come. But kind of a here's the problem with the possible, right? You know, it, it's not possible until it's already here, and then so we're like stuck with this idea. Oh my God, it's already here. Jesus, the future is now. You know, so um, it's amazing. Uh, I recommend you check it out. I guess that was my answer to your question. It was to you. <laughs> For the newbies, distinguish between CryptoKit and Dark Wallet, and what have you threatened CryptoKit with that they're stuck on just one uh, extension for one browser? Uh, well, I, you know, so I think Anthony is Anthony here. Anthony, I think Anthony thinks we're somehow Dark Dark Wallet's a competitor to CryptoKit. I mean, I don't, I don't think we really are. So here's the thing: back when we crowdfunded uh, Dark Wallet. Mercifully, thankfully, there wasn't Bitcoin really in the browser. It had been a kind of suggestion. The crypto kit wasn't out, and neither was spare coins and these other things. So we were able to crowdfund on this. If we were like a month later, we wouldn't have been able to. We did what it already exists. It's called crypto kit. Um, the thing is, that's run as a business, basically, or operated by a business. You can think of it as a service, maybe. And it would never fly in the United States with the native coin joint that we'd like to do on it, which is, of course, let's say that it's a form of money laundering. Um, which should come standard, we think, coreware. You should be able to play around with native coins in your, in your browser going Bitcoin. I believe the only kind of critical difference between a dark wallet and a crypto kit is that crypto kit doesn't offer native coin join. That's not me accusing it of kind of whatever, affirming or I'm just saying that you know, it's interested in giving you Bitcoin easily as a layer of your web experience, helping you do things like encrypt your traffic, manage your currency easily. I mean, it has a... It's one of the best ways of doing PGP. PGP is kind of clumsy still. CryptoKit is actually done very well by importing and exporting keys. And I think it's a beautiful thing and kind of proof that that space is right for development. That space, I mean, Bitcoin in the browser. Uh, but Dark Wallet is, uh, at its heart, purely open source, not run as a business or a service. And, and basically, it has to be that way because any other kind of way of trying to run it, especially trying to monetize it, um, makes us vulnerable to state interdiction. And of course, you know, we have to spend our time in cages. And we have to, like, I'd have to Skype it, like Charlie Shrim or something, you know? Robot, Cody Wilson on stage or something. Oh, uh, CoinJoin is an I So, I mean, CoinJoin is how we talk about manipulating Bitcoin transactions, mixing inputs and outputs. And it's kind of like, you've heard of Bitcoin mixing before? It's basically like a way of maybe mixing, like kind of obfuscating identities and inputs. And, um, the way we do this coin join, the way that it's still being done, um, you see a transaction that you're kind of, it's basically a total fudge about what happened in that transaction. Still so enters the blockchain, but you're like, you've confused what the inputs and outputs were, basically. And that's the best way I can say it. I'm certainly not technical enough to, if Mir was here, he would, actually, he would probably make it more complicated as well. Uh, so, sorry, we're running out of time. Are One we, more question. Sorry. Yeah, so sort of big picture question in terms of how do you get 
people on both an individual level as well as um, the underlying pipeline level to get to this idea that everything should be encrypted, everything should be secured by default. So that way, the act of, let's say, sending a PGP encrypted message isn't itself an invitation to be uh, suspected of something, right? So if we communicate securely and everyone's communicated securely, then that becomes the default. How do you get people to that level that they would actually want that, not only want it on an individual level, but be willing to build it into their products? Okay, great question. Everywhere, and this is going like, to render me an optimist or something, and I'm not, but <laughs> every, everywhere except in the United Kingdom, there's been a certain sea change in, in public opinion, I guess at least in the West, um, about privacy as a default a kind of condition, um, or at least something of a, a general terror about the idea. Oh, right, there is no such thing, and I really should have some. So there's been a kind of cottage privacy industry pop back up after Mr. Edward Snowden did the Lord's work. Uh, <laughs> and it was great. You know, if you, if you weren't aware of it before, or like crypto and all these people in the 90s were the, the due diligence carriers of all things awful in NSA. You know, they had been kind of reminding us, yeah, by the way, you live in a totally unfree kind of situation, but Snowden at least delivered that to us in such a potent way, and we should thank Laura, and we should thank Lynn Greenwald. Um, but I think actually that there is a real appetite now for privacy as a, as a default position, kind of built into the core of, the, of our applications. And, our web experience, and, and that a lot of companies are responding to this, and now it's kind of like, like a soothsayer or some kind of like Pollyanna about the ethics of Google and Yahoo and these people. No, of course, they're total traitors to you, and they're you know, buying and selling you, chewing you, and reaching you, but um, I've, been really, I've been really excited to see projects like Himless, I think Dark Water, where you know, we had a very kind of uh, off-the-cuff, ad hoc crowdfunding strategy, we raised 100 grand. Right? I think really it comes down to someone kind of declaring their will to give you that kind of privacy in a package. And everyone who's done that so far, with at least coherently, has been rewarded and monetarily I mean, by a project, by a, a chance to give that, uh, that in, into the market. So people want it, I think. And um, wanting it is, is right. That demand is almost the entire battle. So while people are conscious and demand it, you should give them great software. And I think it's, I think it's happening right now. Now, in the crypto wars, there was this huge fascination with PGP. I met Sheldon Richmond the other day. He lives in Arkansas. Now. It's crazy. You go to Arkansas, I mean, like a Sheldon Richmond, all these other great new left anti war people. Um, he was saying, yeah, I used to use PGP, but you know, this is, this is the story. I, I, I stopped. And then something like Web 2.0 happened and big data happened, and like, it wasn't important anymore. But it's important again. And while it's important again, it's going to have to be people like you, man, developing just neat software for people that. that just takes care of them by default because you know we're, we need it that way. We're not going to take those extra steps. It has to kind of be built for us. But it, it seems to be happening. Ladies and gentlemen, well, uh, Cody Wilson, come talk to me. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things are to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. told about the death of old Mount Gox, about traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks. But them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee, see they don't care to be a millionaire, they're just wanting to be free. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain, till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. A promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows
everybody knows till everybody knows your name till everybody knows everybody knows till everybody knows your give me some exposure everybody knows your name sing it oh lord pass me some more oh lord before i have to go oh lord pass me some more Amir, the first time I saw you speak was, uh, I think it was on BBC. You were wearing what looked like a school uniform, and your hair was nicely groomed. <laughs> what changed? Um, Muffy, I run, I run many businesses in my life, and yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so, I, you know, we've talked a couple of times over the last few days, and one of the things that you've said a few times is you've told me a story about your friend who makes, uh, who makes marmalade uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, from expired food, basically. And the thing that I keep wanting to ask, and I haven't had a chance yet, is is there any circumstance under which you think that it's good to have government regulations, or it's good to have standards and regulations that restrict people from doing things, or is it just uh, across the board, no? I'm, I'm not. I'm not thinking that we should, uh, you know, nuke the planet. You know, go back to living in caves, destroy everything that we've built and come towards. But certainly, we can put our minds together and think how we would like things to be, and find a way that we can move in that direction. When I look at the work that you've done with Libitcoin and a variety of the other projects, Dark Wallet's another example, um, it's obvious that you have a ideological take on this and that the purity of that ideology is very important to you. So can you kind of articulate why it is that you live the life that you do and do the work that you do? Um, you know, as, as technologists, our job is to build tools for people to use. And we now find ourselves in an empowering position uh, because of the legacy left to us by many people over history who built the technology with a certain set of ethics and morals in mind. And as someone with a huge amount of skill, you have a responsibility to, to carry that legacy onwards. There's a revolution in our time, perhaps more perhaps as important as the invention of DNA itself. The potential for a, or for a global consciousness is emerging with a, with, a, with a nervous system that spans the entire globe. The internet is, is, is something that really has a lot of potential to change the things, the way that we assemble as human beings, the way that we do things. And I spend a lot of time since I was very young living in different communities, in different squats and places, and see the people who try to, to find other ways that they can live better and change the situation around them and observe what are the, what are the issues or problems that they have and think that in my work how I can build better tools to serve the, those people to, to be able to better construct you know, something that can allow, can allow us to, to thrive as free people. So you've spent a lot of time at Califo, which is sort of a, a post, post-capitalistic sort of... Well, uh, they, they call it a, a techno-industrial eco-village. A techno-industrial And Califo is very interesting because I, I be, I've seen a lot of different, uh, you know, eco-villages and, and, and so on. And, uh, one of the things that they're doing with Califo is uh, inve investing uh, energy and resources into technology and industry with a proper economic model behind it. Um, when, you, when, you go to the, when you see some of the squats, sometimes, especially like in London, the people is moving a lot, like from week to week in different places. And when you're, when you're in a place where you're not going to be a long time, you're less inclined to invest your time and your energy to build something nice. And, and when you, you only think you're going to be there a few days, you might not like, keep the place clean, you know? People even become destructive, a lot of tensions between the people arise, but 
the, but when when people are in a place where they they know that the, they the, they have the opportunity of that place that they can make something that people really become constructive especially when you give the opportunity for people to pursue their own visions or their dreams and and people and the difference is between a guy you know like when the people used to get slaves and 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 you know tell the slaves you know, pick the cotton and you really can't get them to do anything much more complex than picking cotton and the only way that you can scale up or improve it is to double the amount of people doing that manual labor and it's the same thing really with with um, in the incentive structures where you have employees working on something but if people do the projects but it's the project that they want to do and it's their passion they do it a lot with a lot more creativity and a lot more drive and the money goes a lot further we see it's in all the open source projects and um, and with Colorfo, they think to get a place that they they find a way that they can buy this land like a massive piece of land with many different buildings all around and reconstruct an old industrial complex with diversity of use of the space that you that you have hackers you have a bio lab mechanics people doing wood and metal uh, there's a enterprise that makes furniture people with agriculture all different people and uh, and, and really thinking thinking about the things and with the with the technology uh, so that my friends go and they occupy a big big forest like one hour from outside London and the people there start to construct houses nice houses like there's a there's like log cabins with the wooden planks on the floor and the walls and everything there's like some girl who built this like house with two floors and a balcony like all by herself and 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 you really start to think like you, you know like you give a few basic things to these people like industrial tools that so they can have the bricks and they will build really nice houses or or the technological tools like in the winter it's it's very cold outside and you, it's a lot of hard work like to 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 pick the firewood and do all the things and and it's very muddy outside and it's a big space so a lot of people are are trekking to the other side to go and talk to the people and it's very difficult for a community to self-organize together and be self-managed but you put internet in all the houses and the people can have a have a room a chat room and coordinate through IRC or or forums uh, and, and suddenly the things can work a lot better or basic infrastructure like gas that people can use to cook and make meals even just thinking economically about how we do the things to do them smarter like a uh, like in in Calafo, there's like a kitchen, and and anytime you want, you can go and cook some food, and and there's the ingredients there and make something. Uh, but I I notice in the, in the squats sometimes people are like buying these snacks, and and you buy these snacks and they're they're more expensive. You when you eat them, you're always hungry, you know, and it's it's crappy food. It's not it's not really giving you energy or anything, but. If you buy the basics like the potatoes and the rice and those things you can you can and 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 you cook proper meals then like for instance in Calafo uh, everybody tries to cook a meal at least once a week and with two or three other people and if everybody in the community does that then you can have a warm meal three times a day and eat and eat better you know and live better and just thinking about how you do these things you, there's a lot of different things that we can see how we can do together to, to make the things better and, and to like live in a place where where you, you where you own the where you have sovereignty, you own something. A lot of the times like going for our life where we're we're renting and working for years and years with a mortgage and at the end a lot of people have nothing, you know, they they're living off credit, off debt, and that's not a way to live. But like for instance with the open source ecology is a project to construct the forty basic machines that you need to make a self-sustainable town or village but in such a way that these machines are easy to build DIY low cost and with each of the parts modular so if you have the industrial base you can reuse the parts in different machines so the, th the things like the brick press or the tractor or the trencher things that save on labor like it's not the same as a hundred years ago we have the technology and the tools now that we can live better and, and, and localize and, and connect also more closely our consumption with our production we have we have now optimized our 
of production so much that the, the, the real cost is in the distribution of a lot of the things. And we've moved, moved production to these centralized uh, nodes. Now, one of the, the biggest I think, I think one of the biggest uh, changes in the market was around the 70s when people were, when they, they started to sell different kinds of tomato soup. And, and the, they, they did, well before the people used to do the studies and say, okay, uh, how much sugar should we put, how much salt, like what consistency should we make it, and then getting like the averages and, and making like the, the single product, the best tomato soup for the, for the market. But then like some, some physicist came along and, and he actually proposed to actually, we should make different kinds of tomato soup. Some people like it lumpy, some people like it spicy, and all different customized for each people. And that's part of the revolution with 3D printing that we, we can actually build the things for ourselves as we need them ourselves, better serving us. And that's the same thing with the, with the production and the consumption. Move the things locally, use the tools that that we can better connect the, the consumption with the production and, and also the, the, uh, the, not only that the things can be better, that you're eating better, that you're, you're consuming local produce that is, that is made by local farmers, but, but also that the, we're, we're more aware of the hidden costs in our consumption because uh, because there's, there's a lot of things, the way that we're living or the way that we're doing things now, that is on a tra trajectory that isn't really sustainable, that, that is, is causing massive amounts of unseen damage, and the, the effect on our lives is, is not very good. Like, we, we look to someone and, it's, and we, we, we yearn for someone who will care for us, who will, who will forgive us of our childish mistakes. And the reality is, is that we are the custodians of life's meaning. We, 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 we search for a purpose, but we, we make our own purpose. <laughs> This is Stephen Levine, CFO of Let's Talk Bitcoin. As someone who pays bills with Bitcoin, I find it immensely satisfying that I can pay our designer in Canada quickly and easily. A couple of button clicks and Bitcoin moves over miles and borders, unfettered by overbearing bureaucracy. It is our goal here at Let's Talk Bitcoin to create structures that allow Bitcoin and all of its descendants to thrive and grow into the safe, free, and fair invention that Satoshi wrote about. In my spare time, I'm also the president of Bitcoin Packaging. BitcoinPackaging.com makes it easy to use your currency of choice to purchase mundane products. We empower you to change the financial world by spending your Bitcoin. When you buy a product from BitcoinPackaging.com with Bitcoin, we will send you a 10% rebate off of the already low prices. BitcoinPackaging.com is a virtual company. We have no warehouse, trucks, or salespeople. Come to our store, take a look around, spend some Bitcoin, and tell your friends. BitcoinPackaging.com So then let's talk about what the world looks like in 10 years. You know, we were talking with, uh, you know, Andreas and, uh, and uh, Jeffrey were up here and they were talking about the, the world of post-national currencies and uh, denationalized currencies and they were talking about it as if this was something that perhaps was 50 years out. But I think that in practice we've seen that when change happens, it tends to happen quite fast. And I'm curious, you know, I suspect you've thought about this. What do you think happens if we win? Um, I don't. I don't. I. I'm not a utopia. Ut I'm not like into utopias and stuff. I'm. I'm. I'm past dogma, and I'm not really into uh, ideologies. I think there is too much of this labelling and categorising. I think we should elevate the discussion to more talking about values and ethics. What kind of values do we want to promote in a society, and how can and and it's it's one thing to talk about. It should be like this, it should be like that, but the only way that people are going to adopt the things is if they're better than what, if the alternatives are better than what is already provided. And that's how we have to start thinking, you know? We have to start thinking with being, and being results oriented about what we need. And, and uh, you know, it's, 
it's one of the biggest tragedies of our, our modern era, the, 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 the great waste of, of human talent that we couldn't or, or wouldn't use. And if we can somehow think to apply that, you know, that people is, people is often working in, in jobs or doing things that's against their self-interest, but for money. But it, you know, at some point you get to your life and you start to think, okay, what, how am I going to pay for this? Or how am I going to have the health care or, or do this? But to take that worry away from people and, and that people can do the things that matter and then think, how can I make that sustainable? How can I use the market or the power of these tools to, to grow what I, how I want to see the things? And if we're all doing this together, the more of us there are, the stronger we are. You know, and fundamentally people are good. You know, people, there's, there's a lot of people I see here today striving for good things and looking forward to the future with the way that the things are heading, with the, you know, with the, the exponentially increasing, it doesn't matter what the roof on the resources is, but the exponentially uh, increasing use of resources, the population is increasing, the rest of the world wants to also match our energy use, combine all these together, we're going to hit that roof sooner or later. The, the police are being given more and more powers every day, you know, more and more laws and legislation that they can use to, to in, in, in how they want to enforce their vision of the world. The, the surveillance state is getting absolutely enormous. Like when the Snowden revelations first came out, it was... It was, uh, but isn't this good? I mean, you know, from the perspective of you're saying that these systems can only take hold if they are so obviously better than the alternatives that we have before us. So isn't the fact, uh, I mean, isn't that good from the perspective of now it's much more likely that these, al these alternatives will be attractive relative nah, man, to... No, man, it's, it's not, it's, that's like saying is, war is good because it, it spurs innovation. That's <laughs> 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 like... Yeah, and uh, but it, it's like uh, yeah, you know the like when the Snowden stuff came out, and in the beginning it was like, wow, this is cool. Like we hackers have been saying this for a long time. You know, if I can download a piece of software off the internet, and in in you know a couple of hours start tracking people's faces, you can bet that in London with all the CCTV everywhere, it's already being done and logged in massive databases. But with every revelation, it gets more and more crazy, like more, like mind-blowing, uh, like the scale of this. And this is not targeted surveillance. This is dragnet surveillance, flying drones over entire neighborhoods, entire communities of people, and harvesting all of their communications and data. The um, logging 60 million phone calls in, in one month in France alone and 70 million in Spain. But again, this it's is that usual, who right? is the darkest before the dawn sort of thing. Again, in order for the alternative to emerge, again, if everything was great, why would these systems be appealing? It's going to, you know, it's, it's going to, the things is polarizing a lot more. And for a lot of people, it's going to get very, very bad. You know, but the things is, like we're in an economic downturn, you know, with, uh, you know, with the, with the massively burgeoning uh, bureaucratic state and all the red tape. Uh, and meanwhile, for the normal person, they're, they're working nine to five, doing a job they increasingly hate, for less and less pay. And, f and for what? For a box in the city? But again, it, this is, uh, you know, it just seems like all of these things that you're saying, these are reasons why people aren't invested in the current paradigm. You know, if they were successful with their job, if they were happy with the place that they live. But, it, but a, lot of, a lot of people is continuing to do the things the same, same way, and they will continue. Well, what are the alternatives? This is the thing, is that these, anyways, you know. Um, the, the thing is, people is, is, the future is not going to be like a sudden crash or like some apocalypse. It's going to be like the things declining and getting a lot, lot more oppressive, a lot more harder to live. You know, with all the, the the scarcity of the resources as well, but but meanwhile, that's why we've got to put our minds together and think. Okay, how can we build something for the future that where that we as free free people can survive and thrive and grow as a culture? And it's it's not only about making this project or that project, but about the idea. Because uh, once you make something that that shows that it's possible. The imagination is there. You do it a couple times more, 
here, then people start to reproduce with the documentation on the internet. These are the steps you need to take, you know, and, and then people go and they start to replicate it. And that's how you grow, grow as a culture and take the things over. Okay, we just have another uh, yeah, yeah. another couple of minutes, but I uh, I want to talk to you about Libitcoin. Ah, yeah. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, Libitcoin. Um, the second time I heard you speak uh, was on the Plan B show back in maybe yeah, yeah. August or September, and you explained that you were working on Libitcoin, which is an alternative implementation of the Bitcoin specification, because right now the world that we live in with only the Satoshi client as the primary implementation is a world like one where you only have Internet Explorer. Yeah, there's well, no, there's a, yeah. There's one of the biggest threats to Bitcoin is centralization of development. Now, it's not enough that the source code is open source. There's a lot of decisions deep down on the technical level that only very few people understand, like Peter Todd or, or a handful of other people. You know, between, and when you're faced with that decision between A or B, if, you're, if your motive is, is slightly corrupted, you know, if you're, you know, maybe you're working for some corporation, you know, maybe you might take the choice B, which slightly favors, you know, corporations over black markets, you know, and, you know, then next time you take, an, it happens again and again, and the, the, and it's, the, it's not like some sudden big backdoor put in by the government, it's the sum of many small steps that slowly morph Bitcoin into something very different from, from the Bitcoin with the principles of Satoshi encoded into there. You know, the, it becomes a gov coin or a corp coin, and it's not no longer serving the interests of, of the people. The, a, a Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin for, for small businesses, for peer-to-peer -peer transfers, for the black market. We already see, and it's, it's not only about the, 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 the protocol or, or, you know, certain consensus uh, development decisions, it's also about features about where do we as a people invest our time and energies. Because just like the internet, there are people who develop technologies to track people, to surveil people, to censor people, to limit people's freedom, you know? And, 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 and this is gonna, this is, and it, it doesn't even have to come from corporations, you know? It can come from, from ourselves, from, from Bitcoin corporations that say, we need to protect our liability, we need to protect our interest and going and implementing features like the like the blacklists or triangulation of transactions or or any number of different features that we can't foresee right now but you know in the future there will be that pressure that inertia to develop those things so so but we need actually people who's developing bitcoin in the spirit or, or with the integrity of what bitcoin was intended for a tool to serve people to serve a, a market which empowers everybody and it's very important that that we have the voice in that development circle and we're not going to get that voice by going to the foundation and and, put, and asking to be part of their inner circles the way that we're going to get the voice is by forcing the issue by making software that's better that people want to use and the way that it's going to be better is by playing on our strengths what strengths do we have we have software that is is equitable that everybody can use that everybody everybody can transact with their with their anonymity intact that they can use crypto features uh, unencumbered with one another and 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 that is what we have to do do with bitcoin and 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 moving away from this image of bitcoin as a tool to buy a drink in a bar you know um, as 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 something to make it easier for 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 you to shop in the supermarket you know like yeah i've got my iphone yeah oh using bitcoin you know i'm i'm not i'm not criticizing that but i'm saying there's there's a there's a a bigger reason for Bitcoin. The Bitcoin brings us new tools, you know, that, that we can exploit. Everybody can use these tools. And that we can use it to really construct something different, like that hasn't ever been imagined before possible and is, and is better than what exists. Like the, the, crypto, the crypto features. And with the dark wallet, we want to bring these features out to the people, for the young entrepreneurs, you know, the tools of trade and business of the future. And then it, it goes beyond just new finance. It go, the blockchain is, a, is an amazing new data structure that we can use. 
and he goes into things about resource management. How can, how can communities or groups of people, it used to be that we had small communities before, but now we have the technology to link up these communities and actually make them scale on a bigger level, for people to be able to organize together on a much larger scale. Tools of governance. You know, I spend a lot of time in, in community seeing how do the people govern and each one has a different culture just like every open source project has a different culture. There are different models with different trade-offs that serve different people and that's the problem with having one government enforced by one state. You know, maybe there, are, there could be startup governments like what the CIC is doing in Catalonia. They, they, are, they are making, they are using the legal structure of a cooperative. Well, so let me give you the lightning question here because we're oh, just yeah. about out of time. Uh, Amir, this has been great. Okay, so at the beginning of this conversation, I said that you have ideology that's important to you. In the middle of this conversation, you told me that you don't identify with ideology anymore. And instead, it's about values. So in less than you know, a minute, can you articulate what you think the most important values are for you? Uh, I had a list somewhere. <laughs> um, I met this Jeff Ber Berwick guy last night, and he was t he was he was telling me about his his plan, yeah, to get some African nation, pay off the 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 government and the the politicians, divide it up into shares, and sell the country out. And I was like, what if some some guy buys up half the country? And he's like, what? It's private property. You know, and I was like, but who enforces that? And he goes, you have the right to enforce that. That for me is so f***ed up, like, yeah. that you just, that some, some rich, rich white f***er yeah. goes and buys, buys half the country, puts his mansion there, and says, this is my space with the guns and the military, it's another mafia. And, uh, you know, that, that's not, for so me... no more mafias? No mafias, no. And it's like, it's not about... I want my sovereignty, f the other guy. No, it's like, I, I want my sovereignty, we want our sovereignty, and I'm gonna link with my friends and do the things together. What is better than to live with your friends working on cool projects with swimming pools, you know, a gym, boxing gym, hat club, your cinema, all for yourself, and you own the land together, you know, like a, a massive space where you can have big party and nice girls around and live free and do what you want, you know, and have all your friends come and visit you. And like with, and, and not only like a hundred people, 10,000, a million, and all having fun and being free. That's, that's the way to live. Yeah. Thanks for listening to episode 111 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for this episode was provided by Brave the World and Can Awareness. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and the boys from BitcoinsandGravy.com with their ode to Satoshi. Thanks for listening.